In this quick board review lecture, I'm going to cover the anti-hyperlipidemic agents. And that includes the following groups. The HMG-CoA reductase inhibitors, the fibrates, niacin, bile acid sequestrants, and cholesterol absorption inhibitors. Let's get started. The HMG-CoA reductase inhibitors are a very important group of drugs. Five out of five, you've got to know these drugs for your exams. The more common name for these drugs is the statins. However, the mechanism of action is actually found in the first name. They are reversible and competitive inhibitors of HMG-CoA reductase. That is a very important rate-limiting enzyme in the pathway that produces cholesterol in our liver de novo. On the right, I have a picture to explain this, but I'm going to break it down and walk through the steps. Starting with acetyl-CoA, Acetyl-CoA is an important molecule in biologic reactions, and it plays an important part in the synthesis of cholesterol. Acetyl-CoA is basically an acetyl group that is linked to coenzyme A. Let me just shorten coenzyme A to just CoA. So in that first step on our list below, you can see that if we combine two acetyl-CoAs together through the enzyme thiolase, we get a molecule called acetoacetyl-CoA. If we then take that molecule and add another acetyl-CoA through the enzyme HMG-CoA synthase, we have HMG-CoA. And this is where the statins work. The statins block the next step. What's supposed to happen is that this HMG-CoA is supposed to be reduced to mevalonic acid. Again, the statins block this from happening and therefore ultimately inhibit or decrease the production of cholesterol de novo in the liver. Major side effects for the statins include hepatotoxicity. However, while this can be severe, only about one to two people per 10,000 patient years have this problem. What's more common by far is myositis or myalgias. It is very common that your patients could complain of muscle aches while on this medication. And in severe cases, they could have rhabdomyolysis from it. As for examples for the statins, we have these four here, rosuvastatin, atorvastatin, simvastatin, and lovastatin. And I organized this list in this way on purpose. On the right side of this little list are the equivalencies. Rosuvastatin is the strongest of these four statins with an equivalency of 1.0. Lovastatin is the weakest of these statins with an equivalency of 8. In other words, you would need, theoretically, and it doesn't work out exactly, but you would need about 8 milligrams of lovastatin to equal the effect that you get with 1 milligram of rosuvastatin. And finally, if you really want to impress your preceptors, look up the asteroid trial, which was done in 2006. It showed that patients who were treated with 40 milligrams of rosuvastatin actually had a regression of their atherosclerotic plaques at a two-year follow-up. Moving on. Now the fibrates. These drugs are pretty easy to pick out in a group because they end in fibrate or fibrozil. These drugs are often given in combination with the statins because there's not a lot of good evidence to support using them alone. As for their mechanism of action, they act by stimulating or activating the peroxisome proliferator activated receptor subtype alpha, or abbreviated PPAR alpha. Don't confuse this with PPAR gamma. The PPAR gamma is stimulated by the related class of drugs, the thiazolidine diones, which are used for diabetes. So naturally in the body, these PPAR alpha receptors are found on the cell nucleus. They are used in the regulation of carbohydrates and fatty acids. When we stimulate these receptors with the fibrates, we change that metabolism. And this works by having the drug bind the receptor, which makes the receptors move into the nucleus. Once in the nucleus, the PPAR alpha binds another receptor called the retinoid X receptor. And that complex binds DNA on sequences that are called peroxisome proliferator hormone response elements. These response elements are responsible for the expression of proteins that are involved in the metabolism of fatty acids and triacylglycerides. So for example, you would see an increase in the expression of lipoprotein lipase. This would increase the metabolism of triacylglycerides. 
Also, it would increase the expression of apolipoprotein A1 and apolipoprotein A2. Those are lipoproteins that are important in the structure of an HDL particle. The side effects for the fibrates include GI upset. This is really common. You very well could see your patient complain of a stomach ache on the fibrates. Also, as previously mentioned, the fibrates increase a person's risk for myositis or myalgias, especially when taken with the statins. And last for the side effects of the fibrates, because we change the metabolism of lipids, we increase the excretion of cholesterol in the bile, thus increasing the risk for cholesterol gallstones. Okay? And finally, three examples of fibrates are bezafibrate, gemfibrozil, and phenofibrate. All right. Next in our adventures through the antihyperlipidemics is niacin. Niacin is also called vitamin B3, nicotinic acid, and it has the brand names of Nispan and Nicor. Yes, this is the niacin of which a deficiency causes the disease pellagra, which, don't forget, is known by the three Ds, diarrhea, dermatitis, and dementia, covered in a separate lecture. The mechanism of action for the antihyperlipidemic effect of niacin is that niacin acts on niacin receptors, niacin receptors 1 and 2. This causes a decrease in lipolysis in the adipose tissue, which therefore decreases the production of fatty acids, thereby decreasing the production of triacylglycerides and very low-density lipoprotein particles in the liver. Also, one of the cool things about niacin, or, or one of the neat things that niacin can do, is it really uh, does a great job of increasing a patient's HDL. And this it does by increasing the expression or production of apolipoprotein A1, which we previously mentioned in the previous slide for the fibrates, is one of the important components to an HDL particle. And also it decreases the hepatic HDL uptake, so it lets HDL circulate longer. Niacin is famous for causing cutaneous flushing and puritis. I haven't met anyone yet who has taken this medicine at a therapeutic dose and hasn't felt a little bit flushed or at least a little bit itchy. This isn't dangerous, it's just annoying, and it can be decreased by preemptively taking an NSAID before you take niacin. Niacin can also cause hepatotoxicity, and this is one of the more serious side effects of niacin, but not necessarily very common. Lastly for the side effects, niacin inhibits the tubular secretion of uric acid. That increases the circulating concentration and thus increases the risk of gout in someone who may otherwise be predisposed to that condition. Niacin is high yield. Remember niacin. Bile acid sequestrants, also called bile acid resins, are a pretty important group. I'm not going to give them a 5 out of 5. I'm going to give them a 4 out of 5 on the importance scale. We use them to treat patients with hyperlipidemia. And they work by interrupting the enterohepatic circulation of bile. So real quick, what is that? Enterohepatic circulation deals with or refers to the circulation or the cycle of bile being produced by the liver, excreted through the biliary system, moving through the GI tract where they participate in the absorption of other fatty acids, triglycerides, and cholesterols, and then being resorbed themselves broken down, returned to the liver, and then reproduced, and then the cycle repeats itself. About 90 to 95 percent of bile salts that the liver produced are resorbed or returned or cycle through the system. So if we interrupt this pathway, the liver has to continually produce more bile. So if we can somehow interrupt this circulation so that the bile is no longer resorbed but instead is passed in the stool, then the liver is forced to regenerate bile, which is produced from cholesterol. So how do bile acid sequestrants do this? Well, they act as ion exchange resins, which exchange anions, like chloride for example, for bile salts, thereby binding or sequestering the bile acids or bile salts from the intrahepatic circulation. 
forcing the bile salts to be excreted in the feces instead of being reused. The side effects for the bile acid sequestrants are pretty few, honestly, and the reason for this is that these drugs are not absorbed systemically. They are meant to be taken and passed through the GI system, taking bile salts with them. Most often, what I've seen is that patients will complain of a bad taste. Sometimes patients will complain of constipation, diarrhea, bloating, flatulence, but usually they're well tolerated. A few examples of bile acid sequestrants include cholestyramine, cholestopol, and lastly, colecevalam. Now for the cholesterol absorption inhibitors. Really, there's only one of these, one of them that's commonly used anyway, and that's azetamib, also known as zedia. The mechanism of action for zedia is related to, but not quite the same, as the bile acid sequestrants. So I'm going to use the same picture to talk about it. Remember, the bile acid sequestrants block the resorption of bile. Thus, the liver has to create new bile from circulating cholesterol, fatty acids, and triglycerides. The cholesterol absorption inhibitors kind of work the same. They block the absorption of cholesterol from the brush border in the small intestine. This decreases the amount of cholesterol that's available to the liver, so the liver has to seek it elsewhere. It has to pull it from the circulation. Side effects for Zetia could include myalgias, like we've seen in some of the other families of drugs, a headache, and transaminitis, which means an elevation in liver enzymes, which in turn is basically just telling us that the liver is irritated. Okay? This last slide is just to help you understand uses for the previously described drugs. So for example, if you have a patient that really needs help with their LDL, but not necessarily any of the others, an HMG-CoA reductase inhibitor would probably be your best bet, a statin in other words. If on the other hand, you're trying to increase someone's HDL, niacin is the best. Okay, so I won't waste your time in explaining this further, but if you need to study this, go ahead and pause the video. Alright guys, thanks for watching this board review video. I really like making these videos. I have a lot of fun with it. And I know that something like this could have helped me through school. I'm basically running through the first aid board review book. If you need me to do a video for you, send me a message and let me know. As always, good luck in school.